Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Singularity One-on-One. Singularity One-on-One is a regular podcast for Singularity Weblog, where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. Today, my guest at the show is Michael Vassar. Michael Vassar is the president of the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence and provides overall leadership of the institution as it develops its research capabilities and its role as a forum for discussion of the challenges and potential of artificial general intelligence. Hello, Michael. It's very nice to have you here today. Hi, nice to see, talk to you as well, Nicola. Thank you. So without further ado, I'll jump straight into the questions uh, with this. Michael, would you mind sharing with us a little bit more about your personal background in general, but in particular, how you got to be interested in artificial intelligence and the technological singularity? Ah, uh, I don't think I became interested. Well, the technological singularity always seems to me to be a fairly straightforward extrapolation from the idea of artificial intelligence, and to the point where I could never really understand how people could write science fiction or tell stories about artificial intelligence, because it seemed too obvious that if you had a machine that could think it could make more copies of itself and improve itself further, and then that, that would increase its ability to do so. So, I always assumed that about AI, I mean, literally, it, it just seemed straightforward, and I always assumed that, you know, that would be kind of the most important thing that would ever happen. But what really surprised me was finding that it seemed to be the sort of thing that was likely to happen during my lifetime, and not a thousand years in the future, etc. And I don't think that I was so much convinced that it was likely by, um, by particular arguments for how it should be done or how easy it would be to do. I mean, that was important. But the most important consideration really was coming to realize that if that was true, if the evidence did favor the belief that AI was likely in this century, it was plausible that that could be true, but not be generally known by everyone, or by everyone well-educated and intelligent, not, not the consensus of the scientific community. Basically, it never occurred to me growing up that the scientific community could lack a consensus on something as important as this. And I think the major change in my thinking was becoming a scientist, going to college and studying biochemistry and uh, doing physics at NIST and all sorts of things, and just discovering that the scientific com community just plain doesn't have opinions in any useful sense. They don't have opinions that are the attempt, the result of attempting to do science, attempting to do some think scientifically on all sorts of broadly scientific matters. They only generally have scientific opinions on fairly narrow, specific types of scientific matters. And so um, it really was the sort of thing that could be true and not be generally known and accepted. I and see. I, you know, and when I looked further, I found that it was really necessary to make a huge amount of work to make any sense out of what scientists did say about such things. But insofar as it was possible to make sense of what they were saying, they were saying, yes, this is going to happen. Yes, it's going to happen this century, or at least the, there's every reason to believe it will. And you shouldn't think about it too hard. You know, the, the scientific consensus really didn't seem to be that this cataclysmically important stuff was not going to happen. It seemed to be that it was going to happen, but it, it, that it shouldn't be thought about. And when you look at the history of science, that's consistent with what scientific consensus was in the past. In many cases. May I get this? I'm sorry. Hi, Infinity Desk. Um, is uh, someone needs to come up? Yes, um, this is Michael Vassar. You can come up. No problem. They can come up. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so 
I have people who want to meet with me, apparently, but I'll, uh, I can continue talking with you at least for a while. So, um, point is, the... common sense view that I'd taken, I mean, it seems to be common sense that if you're going to worry about global warming, because, you know, the consensus, the preponderance of evidence would lead you to believe that it's going to be a significant problem if we continue to burn fossil fuels for another hundred years. Then it would also be common sense that we ought to be worried about things like artificial general intelligence. And I think the reality is that the way the scientific community works is more like, what are the experiments that we can do today? Are there large numbers of experiments that can be done today with existing research techniques, with existing tools. If there aren't, then you shouldn't be thinking about it. However, you know, if you look at the Manhattan Project and the history of the nuclear arms race, this was pretty much the same way. There's a great quote when Enrico Fermi was told about the possibility of a nuclear fission chain reaction by Leo Zillard and uh, Wigner and von Neumann and some others. He said it was preposterous, it was wildly improbable. And he was asked, how improbable? He said, well, maybe one chance in ten. To which they said, well, one chance in ten is not wildly improbable if you may die of it. <laughs> you know? And one chance in ten seems to, I mean, it turned out that it was true, so the chance was one in one, or ten in ten, not one in ten. But one in ten is not such a bad estimate. The problem was not that Fermi was stupid or that he was bad at making estimates. He was probably much better at making estimates than almost everyone. The problem is that he was adhering to a set of rules for what you should be thinking about or talking about that is flat out insane, frankly. A set of rules that says you shouldn't think about anything until you're ready to do experiments on this weird more or less established experimental techniques. So uh, let me just zoom out a little bit here for a second and, and ask you uh, maybe to give us a little bit of a background idea on the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence and why does it matter and your functions um, or uh, your, your participation in it there. So... My function is to basically make the organization happen. I put together the fellows program, I put together the conferences, basically I do most of the organizational stuff and administrative, logistical, legal, fundraising, what have you. Um, the organization was founded a decade ago by Elias Rigodkowski. He was a very an extraordinarily smart, very young person who also became aware that the singularity was likely to happen and decided that basically nothing else mattered. Normal life was completely irrelevant and, um, you know, founded the Singularity Institute, you know, when, when he was 20, but really he was pretty much stopped life and started working on this when he was 11. So, um, <laughs> we found out about it. He... Want, at first wanted to develop an artificial intelligence, and, because that seemed like the thing to do. And then he later became aware that it would be important for this artificial intelligence to be human-friendly, that being safe was not default, but rather that most possible artificial intelligences would destroy humanity automatically. And this was a very big surprise to him, and he reorganized his thinking and changed his focus to trying to create a friendly artificial intelligence. And that's been his focus ever, ever since. In practice, it turned out that the total global, the total global pool of people who are interested in funding something like that appears to be fairly small, like maybe a few hundred people. Mm -hmm. And in order to, um, in order to make a workable organization, it's necessary to focus on goals that you can show intermediate results. And so a significant so fraction of... what would be the benchmarks that you guys are focusing to show results on? Well, in, in practice what happened, rather than trying to show intermediate results... Sorry, I'm losing the, the sound here. 
Well, in practice, rather than trying to show intermediate results, we decided his approach was pretty much... Are you not hearing? Yeah, yeah, it, it, came just, it just came back. Uh, you know, George Bernard Shaw says that um, reasonable people adjust themselves to the world and reasonable people adjust the world to themselves. Yeah, it's um, one of my favorite quotes. Yes, so rather than adjusting the Singularity Institute strategy, which seemed to be correct, to the world, Elias responded by adjust, trying to adjust the world to its strategy, by teaching the world how to think more rationally, so that they could um, see that they should be funding it, even though it didn't look like a normal charity. Mm -hmm. So he spent a couple of years putting together a series of blog posts that later became the sequences on the Less Wrong wiki, Mm -hmm. and the website lesswrong.com. And you should, if you're interested in us at all at this point, this is probably the main thing you should know about. I will make sure you have the URL. Yeah, I, I've been there. I've, I'm quite familiar with the site. And you've read the sequences, or you've looked at them? I've s sort of skimmed them. I can't say I've read them all, but I've, I've looked through yeah. a few of them. Okay, so... He basically decided to teach people how to think better so that they would be more likely to donate and help the organization to work and also to make better researchers. And it worked very really well. A lot of people decided that this had changed their life and they really felt that they knew how to function in the world better, how to think better, how to be better scientists. And that brought in more people, such as myself, basically, and a lot of other people. I've been paying some attention to him for a long time, but effectively the organization grew, and there was a pool of people who wanted to work with him and with his organization and to continue developing the art of critical thinking. Mm -hmm. So we've developed cities in New York, Los Angeles, Oxford, or London, I forget which, I think Oxford, San Francisco... Chicago, Boston, etc., devoted to cultivating critical thinking. Mm -hmm. We have a fellows program and a research program on artificial intelligence. And now I'm beginning to move on in that direction towards seeing critical thinking as potentially sufficient to fix the world without necessarily needing to develop an AGI first. Now, in the long run, we still need an AGI because nothing else is going to prevent unfriendly AI. But actually, once you have a clear idea of what reliable, high-quality critical thinking should enable, it doesn't seem like we need any advanced technologies to fix the world. We just need people to discuss things reasonably and implement the solutions that people are, are already able to come up with and allocate the existing trillions of dollars of research money to problems that were to quest to questions that actually have a reasonable chance of leading to useful results rather than not having a reasonable chance of leading to useful 